So in the West, our mythology is about the division of space, and we own space. We own the land. We own land. You, have, you own your house. You have title to your land. But we don't own time. We're possessed by time. I made a lunch commitment with a friend of mine for November of next year. Because that's the only time that we both have. So we're possessed by time. We have no time. Time owns us, but we own the land. For the shamanic societies, you have the reverse relationship, where you don't own the land. But this notion of owning the land is a very foreign notion. You don't own the land. You're the caretaker of the land, but you don't own it. It owns you, if anything. But you own time. You have time. You can travel through time. You've heard of this notion of Latin time, right? Of Latin. You know, I, was just, I just came back from Europe a couple of days ago, and somebody was explaining to me the difference between German time and Swiss time. <laughs> Swiss time, as the second hand, it's the 12th, the train is pulling into the station. German time, it's, you know, one or two minutes late. And in Latin America, where I come from, when you ask, is the train on time, it means, is it coming today? <laughs> <laughs> An entirely different relationship to time. You've heard of this notion of mañana. You know mañana? <laughs> mañana means tomorrow. You know, and it's associated with lazy people. These lazy people, everything is mañana. But mañana is actually a very deep philosophy when you look at it within its own context. Mañana means why do today what is going to take care of itself by itself tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, a, there's an old story of a group of shamans that go to the Aborigines, Latin American shamans. They go to Australia. And they ask the Aborigines, do you have this philosophy that we have of mañana. And the elders begin to talk, and an hour goes by, second hour goes by, it gets dark, stars come out. <laughs> Finally, 11 o'clock at night, one of the elders gets up and says, yeah, we have a similar notion in our teachings, but without such a sense of urgency about it. <laughs> <laughs> so a very different relationship, very different relationship with time than we have. We're able to travel through space. When I was tra I'm a medical anthropologist by training, and I spent 25 years in the Amazon and, and the Andes, studying with and working with the indigenous peoples. And they would ask me, where do I come from? And uh, because they were all telling stories at night, and they invite me to tell a story. You know, Jack and Jill and Humpty Dumpty only got me so far. And then I would tell them, geographical stories. So I'd draw the village and the next village and the river and I'd ask them, what's the name of the river? And they say, it's the river. <laughs> say, but every river has a name. So why should we give it a name? It's the only river we have. <laughs> so, I would, so this notion of my coming from North America, they'd ask me, how many days walking did you come? And I said, well, probably be about two years walking and we're making this up. This notion of somebody traveling through space like we do is inconceivable. The, because you didn't leave your village, or if you did, you went one or two villages away. But you did not leave your land. You belong to your land. But they had a notion, the medicine people, of traveling through time. Which to me is totally was totally absurd. What do you mean traveling through time? Time passes through you. You don't pass through time. They say, yeah, of course you can. There's a kind of time. They say it's because you only know one kind of time, Alberto. You only know the kind of time that flies like an arrow, <coughs> where the future is always ahead of you and the past has already happened. But we know another kind of time that turns like a wheel in which you can influence events that occurred in the past, in which you can nudge destiny. And the difference between these is that, see, the problem with linear time is that it's based on cause and effect. The main operating principle is cause and effect. 
And the problem with this, with linear time that flies like an arrow, is that you're always the result of an earlier cause. And it breeds and produces psychotherapists. Because <laughs> you're always the effect of what happened to you when you were 12, or when you were 6, or in your previous lifetime. You're always the result of the genetic inheritance that you, that you, that you got. You're the product of your family's genes. You cannot be informed by the future. The future cannot reach back like a giant hand and begin to pull you forward. So we're always the result of the past. Causality, cause and effect, the basis of modern science is the operating principle. In this other kind of time that turns like a wheel, the main operating principle is synchronicity. The apparent coincidence of seemingly random events. So the, so the shaman and the laika have the ability to step into this time that pretzel and figure eight and looped back on itself to influence events in the past and to nudge destiny, to select the destiny. Now, the best way to conceive of this, you know these flashlights that children have that, that are fiber optic cables on them? Have you seen those? You turn them on and they drop the little fiber optic cables light up. I, I, my kids are grown up now, but I still keep, uh, I love those little lights. <laughs> so, if you can imagine the body of that torch, of that flashlight, as representing the past, and those fiber optic cables that come out the top, as representing possible destiny lines. Possible destiny lines. And of which the most probable ones are the ones that are directly above the flashlight. The ones that are way off to the side are the least probable ones. So for example, there's a group of medicine men and women, and many of our students, I have a, what I do today is to train Western shamans in our Healing the Light Body School, to train Western healers, to train the science and the medicine way. So, Every full moon, next to men and women around the planet gather around the fire to dream the world into being, to envision the kind of world that they want their children's children to inherit. A world where the water is clean, where people live in peace and harmony with each other, where the air is pure. And they know that that's pretty improbable. <coughs> That's one of those destiny lines that falls outside of the main body. But they know that, they're, that the act of finding it makes it a little bit more possible, a little bit more probable, puts a little bit more energy into the system. <clears throat> so the Laika believe that it's not difficult to change the destiny of an individual, but it's very difficult to change the destiny of a people, of a nation. Uh, for example, with the arrival of the Spanish, the, um, the seers of the Inca foretold the arrival of men who would come, who were half animal, half human, because horses were brought originally by the Spanish to the Americas. They spoke about men whose skin was made of steel who had sticks that spoke with fire and with thunder. And, the, uh, and in the outer areas of the Inca Empire, for example, in, in, um, around the, uh, uh, the Temple of the Rainbow, in the area of Trujillo, northern Peru, you find that in a single week, 10,000 yamas were sacrificed in a single week to try to influence the heavens, what was written in the heavens. And of course, you do not change what was written in the stars. Because the destiny of a nation is very difficult to change. <coughs> That's why the seers of old were able to track along the destiny lines of their people. They were able to track along these destiny lines and foretell events that were to come, that were to happen today. So while you could change the destiny line of an individual, very difficult to change the destiny line of a culture, of a people. Not impossible, but it had to be done one person at a time. Each one of us choosing to live in a world in which there was only peace. 
choosing to live in a world where the water is clean, where the air is pure, where we enter into right relationships with each other. And the more of us that do that, the more that we create that world immediately around us, and the more that we dream the greater world into being. But it's one person at a time. So, again, the mythologies of the indigenous peoples have to do with the division of time, which is why they were such great calendar keepers, extraordinary calendar keepers. Now, one of the curious things about the Inca and the Mayan calendar <coughs> and the, is that do you know when humanity first appears on the planet according to many of the indigenous calendars? Most fascinating thing is that humanity first appears in the planet on December 21st, 2012. Then we're still part of the experiment. We're kind of proto-humans. We're not the done deal yet. <laughs> but the notion of the, of the shaman is that evolution doesn't happen only in between generations, like it does for us in the West. For us in the West, evolution happens in between generations, so that maybe your children will be smarter and handsomer than you are, but it's too late for you. <laughs> Sorry. So, shamans understand that, yes, change does happen between generations, but evolution prefers to work within generations. Within generations. That we can quantum leap into who we are becoming within our generation. That, you know that every eight months you grow an entirely new body? That not a single molecule, a single atom in your body was there eight months ago. Eight months ago, it was there and elk, and salmon, whale, and river. But they understood that we have a luminous energy field that surrounds the physical body, and that informs the physical body in the same way that a magnet organizes iron filings on a piece of glass. So the shamans were able to step outside of ordinary time, of that time that flies like an arrow, and step into this kind of circular time that turns like a wheel. And they were able to track who we are becoming 10,000 years from now. And in doing so, they were able to download version 7.0 or 7.1 of the software that informs our luminous energy field. Because the luminous energy field is a software that informs the hardware, which is DNA. DNA is really, it's, it's the computer, it's the hardware. What it does is to manufacture proteins. That's all DNA does. If you can download version 7.1 of the software, you can grow new bodies that age, that heal, and that die differently. And that's the opportunity presented to us today as we become a new species in the planet, as we become homo luminous, and we can quantum leap within our generation. Oh. It's not the indigo babies, it's not the, the crystal children, they too. But you and I, we're the quantum leap that's happening. And we have the possibility of doing that within our lifetime, in the next three to four years. The window is open, a tremendous window of opportunity. <clears throat> now the Inca chose to call themselves Inca, and the word, if you go back to the, uh, to the chroniclers, the Spanish chronic chroniclers after the conquest, the word means the, ch the child of the sun, someone who is a child of the sun, who recognizes their own luminous nature. And throughout the Americas, you find that the practices are solar practices. You find that there's this amazing connection with the sun as a source of life. They understand that the real bottom of the food chain is the sun. And then you have plants that turn sunlight, that capture electrons, flying at 186,000 miles an hour, they capture one of these electrons, 
and they turn it into life. So the so they understood that the source of our life was the sun. And uh, during times of tremendous change, of cataclysmic change, that our Father, the Son, was there to inform us, to assist us, to catalyze these changes. And guess what's happening in between now and 2012? We have one of the highest activities of solar flares in history. Everybody's really concerned about this because satellites, computer equipment, it's all affected by these solar flares, communication systems. But who, guess who gets to really benefit from that? We do. These solar flares, in effect, are downloads of information that we're getting from our local star, from the stars, from the star beings. Our local star is the sun. <laughs> and so this is a time to go and do your solar practice go and reinform your luminous body and we'll teach you in a little bit how you can open your luminous body and become receptive to these downloads that are happening all around the planet right now and how they have to do with the source of life itself with the sun and with this intense period of solar activity that's happening each one of those solar flares is a tremendous is a lightning bolt of information and energy can't quite photosynthesize yet. But you can receive that, that download and integrate it into your system. 